Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Lars Penke. He is full professor of biological personality psychology at the Georg August University of Göttingen in Germany. His research interests include the evolutionary significance of individual differences, social endocrinology, links of somatometric measures of the body and face with psychological traits, the evolutionary psychology of mate choice, romantic relationships and sexuality, neurostructural indicators of intelligence and cognitive aging, behavior genetics and life history theory. So Dr. Penke, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. And by the way, let me just let me just apologize if I butcher your last name during the interview. <laughs> you pronounce it very well. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I mean, I invited you basically to talk about personality, intelligence, and also a little bit about human mating and mating preferences. And I would like to ask uh, to start with the topic of personality. I mean, I've already had a couple of personality psychologists on the show, and I mean, I, it seems that there are several complicated questions about the evolution of personality that we have yet to answer properly. And I mean, I've, uh, you are the first person basically that I have on the show who does uh, evolutionary genetics of personality and intelligence and etc. So I guess that that could also give us a pretty good insights into the evolution of personality and what's behind it. So the first question I would like to ask you is, how, how do you think uh, about personality from an evolutionary perspective? Interestingly enough, very few people think about the evolution of personality. People take it for granted that we differ, and that is very obvious, and we can now take it for granted that these differences are heritable. I mean, we have uh, over a decade of, uh, uh, over a century actually, of behavioral genetic studies that show that individual differences in personality are heritable. And as soon as you have heritable differences, and these differences matter for what we do in life, then naturally you will have evolutionary selection on them, because these are the three ingredients that you need for evolution by natural selection. Differences that are heritable and that matter for basically in the end reproductive success, but everything that we do in life that matters can potentially affect our uh, reproductive success. So. Even as an undergraduate student, it was very obvious to me that these questions had to be brought together. And I actually, even as an undergraduate, I first worked in a group uh, that was interested in evolutionary psychology, but they said, no, evolutionary psychology is not concerned about individual differences. And then I worked in a group that was working on personality and behavioral genetics, and they said, yeah, well, we can say a lot about this, but we have no connection to evolution. And that simply didn't make sense to me. So my interest in the evolutionary genetics of personality actually date back to my very early undergraduate years. And there was only a handful of authors who even approached this topic at all. I mean, Stephen Gangstead published a bit about it. J. Michael Bailey published a little bit about it. There was uh, people like David Sloan Wilson, for example, who had a few bits about it. Tubian Cosmides had a very early paper in 1990 where they contributed to a special issue of the Journal of Personality, where they basically wrote a piece that had the overall message that, okay, if there are heritable differences in personality, that must be evolutionary noise, that must be neutral genetic variation that simply doesn't affect our life. But that doesn't make sense in terms of all the personality literature that clearly shows that personality predicts everything from socioeconomic status and success you have in work and, and school and where you end up in life to marriage and divorce rates to numbers of children you have and so on. So there was something at odd there. And I've been delving into this topic basically my whole career and I have to say the more I think about it and the more I read about it, the more complicated it gets. So I'm probably not in the position to give you very easy answers. I had this big paper in 2007, the evolutionary genetics of personality, 
It was actually a target article in the European Journal of Personality, the very first in that journal, actually. And that was basically the piece where I wrote down everything that I had on my mind about this topic that had accumulated over years, really. It was part of my dissertation in the end, but I've thought about the topic for years. And at that time, it seemed rather reasonable that there are a handful of genes that have somewhat substantial impact uh, on personality. So everybody was still talking about dopamine genes, serotonin genes, MAO-A and, and all this candidate gene stuff. And from that perspective, it seemed very reasonable that these genetic variants are at a medium frequency in the population because they sometimes have advantages and sometimes have disadvantages because there is no clear advantage of being general advantage in every situation of being more extrovert than introverted. There are parts in life where introverts work better than extroverts. It isn't necessarily the case that being conscientious is always a better way through life. Sometimes less conscientious people at least have higher reproductive success. Uh, it is not even clear that being less neurotic more emotionally stable is always a better way to go because if you live in a very dangerous environment, which we can at least assume our ancestors throughout recent history, but also definitely throughout evolutionary history, have definitely encountered, then it's sometimes really good to be more on the edge, more anxious, more stress prone, because you can adapt to really dangerous situations more easily. So it isn't even clear that a low level of neuroticism is always a better way to go. And I think this general logic that there is not one personality that is absolutely optimal and that natural selection could basically optimize and yeah, unify for everybody, um, that, that is still pretty obvious to me. The genetics of personality, I have to say, become more confusing the more we know about the molecular genetics of personality. So contrary to standard traits like height and contrary to intelligence, where a lot of molecular genetics work has been done, the genetics of personality look rather elusive. So doesn't look like we have this handful of genes that could easily be selected up and down depending on what kind of environmental niche you are in or what kind of, of social environment you are experiencing. Uh, it rather looks like, uh, yeah, it looks messy. It looks like there's a lot of genetic heterogeneity going on, basically meaning that two people, you and I, could have exactly the same extroversion level, but for completely different genetic and biological reasons. And I think we don't really have the best personality models at the moment to approach this topic. So that's probably also the reason why I haven't published that much on the evolutionary genetics of personality in recent years, because I have a really difficult time to make up my mind how it really looks. It looked easier 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. So let me just ask you, do you think that by studying genetics and particularly in this case the genetics behind uh, psychological traits or several different psychological traits that we can get any insights into uh, knowing if they are, if they evolved as adaptations or byproducts or if they are simply the results of uh, um, genetic recombination after sexual reproduction or, or even the results of some rare gene mutations or variants that occur mm -hmm. here and there uh, 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 in different people? Yeah, so for individual differences in any trait to be neutral, the assumption is a rather strict one. There are good mathematical models on how a trait has to look to be evolutionary neutral. And that would basically mean that there are genetic variants, yeah, but these genetic variants are just drifting in the population by chance and uh, are not under evolutionary selection at all. For that to be true, these genetic variants have to be very, very neutral. and you can mathematically calculate how neutral that has to be, but under reasonable assumptions for human populations, it would mean that whether you carry a genetic variant or not should not only impact 
or have no impact on your number of children, but on the number of children in the next 13 generations after you. So the same number of children, grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, and so on over 13 generations. And that has to be a really neutral genetic variant. I don't doubt that these genetic variants exist in our genome. And when we usually get these, these fancy um, uh, Manhattan plots from uh, genome-wide association studies of intelligence, and there are all these hundreds of very weak genetic variants that are hardly significant, it might very well be that some of them are that neutral. But for any genetic variant that really makes a difference for how extroverted or conscientious or open you are, it is a really tough assumption to say that, it, that's, that it's that neutral because we know that these traits matter for what we do in life. Otherwise, personality wouldn't be predictive for anything and we wouldn't care about personality, basically. And so I doubt that personality is completely evolutionary neutral and that the genetic variants underlying personality are completely evolutionary neutral. And yeah, basically the other two big candidates or other three big candidates that can explain why this genetic variance is still there in the population is either that there are genetic variants that are currently in the process of getting selected in the process of being fixated. That basically means that they were probably neutral in our evolutionary past, say back in our hunter-gatherer days or back in the days before we settled down and began to farm animals and so on. And that changes that are currently happening are selecting for these genes. And we know about some cases where that exists, for example, with lactose intolerance, that you can't process uh, milk sugar, basically. So uh, there are a lot of people on the planet who are not able to digest milk properly, especially in Asia, but also in Europe and everywhere on the globe. And the genetic variance for an adult to be able to digest milk only became under selection when we started dairy farming, when we were taming cows and uh, had milk as a, as a constant uh, ingredient to our, uh, our meals, basically. And these genetic variants basically have been selected over the last 10,000 years. And there we probably see evolution in progress. And it might be that there's still some evolutionary pressure at the moment, even though we have a lot of different ways to uh, deal with our nut nutrition nowadays. And we don't have to uh, eat milk products anymore, but there might still be some selection going on there on the human ability to digest milk as an adult. So that is evolution in process. And it might be that some uh, personality traits are still under ongoing selection at the moment. Aaron Lukaszewski has a theory that personality differentiates out depending on how complex uh, your environment is and the everyday life of a hunter-gatherer or somebody else living in a small-scale society is probably less complex than the social and overall cultural environment that we are experiencing in the Western world or in the industrialized world overall. And it might be that personality is currently a bit under selection because of that. And the other two possibilities are either, as I said, that there's not one personality that fits every situation, but that different situation, different environmental niches call for uh, different personality traits. And that's called balancing selection. And balancing selection is usually a little bit uh, doubted by evolutionary geneticists that work on other species, but what is special to the human species is that we have a very, very strong control over our environment. So you're not born into a certain environment like a crop is planted to a field, but you have some influence over your environment, you can shape your environment, you can construct your environment, and you can choose your environment. If you learn that your personality doesn't fit to the small village where you're born, then you move to the big city and you experience a totally different kind of human environment. And because humans are very good in constructing and choosing, selecting their environments, we can basically, and there's actually evidence that we do that, can actually choose our environments fitting to our personality. Mm -hmm. And by that, as long as humans have so much control over their own lives, uh, 
every personality can potentially fit themselves into the right environment where it works best. I mean, we sometimes do stupid life choices and try out things that don't fit us very well, but overall people are rather good to manage to find the niches uh, that fit to them. And that would actually be a process that uh, facilitates balancing selection because not every human experiences the same environment, but we select ourselves into the environments that fit to us. And that is basically keeping diversity in the human population if you let a thousand flowers bloom, basically. And therefore, I still think that balancing selection is a rather big factor in personality. Now, the third possibility that you alluded to is called mutation selection balance. And it basically means that on the one hand, mutations occur all the time. There's very good evidence that that is the case. We have now very good evidence from genome sequencing studies that every human is basically born with around one to two new genetic mutations that uh, have not existed in their parents uh, and that have some impact so that are not functionally neutral. So basically all of us are born with around one to two new mistakes in the genetic code that lead to the fact that we are not all the same. So mutations are basically the source of, of diversity in general, but biological diversity in, in, uh, specifically. And these mutations occur all the time. And when they are really bad, then they might lead to a stillbirth, to uh, lethal consequences, or to somebody being infertile, and then they are selected out of the population immediately from an evolutionary perspective. But it might also be the case that they have rather minor effects and that are the little imperfections that all of us have, while we are all not perfect, even on a biological level, and they can accumulate over generations. So if you have a little mutation that, I don't know, makes your digestion not super efficient or makes you prone to certain illnesses or whatever, then of course that doesn't hinder your life and that means you will still have children, you will still have grandchildren and these mutations will still be passed on. And therefore mutations accumulate over generations and we all probably run around, have been estimates that we all have a few hundreds of functional mutations in our genome that basically lead to the fact that we are not all uh, completely perfect. And but still these mutations will be selected out eventually. There's still selection pressure acting on it. But since the rate of new mutations is probably for, for a certain band of, of mutations that have a certain effect size is probably about the same as the selection pressures that select them out. And we have a balance of new mutations coming in and selection pressures acting against them. And that can also lead to standing genetic variation in the population. And Back in the day, I've argued, actually inspired by people like Jeffrey Miller, that uh, intelligence in particular, as a normally varying human trait, should be in a mutation selection balance. I still think that there's good evidence for that, and there's actually newer evidence to support that. With regard to personality, I usually have the position that it's probably not as much mutation selection balance and more balancing selection. Nowadays, I'm not totally sure anymore, especially for neuroticism. I think there's some evidence coming out that at least the extremer form of neuroticism is probably also under mutation selection balance. And certainly when we reach the, the area where it uh, borders to psychopathology, to depressiveness, anxiety disorders, and all these things, uh, there's even more evidence that mutation selection balance plays a role. Yeah, but to be honest, I mean, there's so much new molecular genetic genomic evidence coming in. The picture doesn't really look simpler, and especially not for personality. And I wouldn't really bet a lot of money on one or the other process at the moment. It has to be something in the realm of the processes uh, I sketched out, and I think that balancing selection will play a role, but it can very well be a mixture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me just ask you two things about all of you, all that you just said. The first one is, so when you refer to things that people do, like for example, when they have their own personality and they decide to move to an environment that suits mm -hmm. their personality or even to themselves 
uh, create a new environment that is in accordance with their own personality. That's what in behavior genetics people call a gene environment correlation, an active exactly. one in this case. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the same process. Uh, uh, behavioral ecologists and uh, evolutionary geneticists are influenced by old ethology and there it was called niches and niche selection but it is basically the same process as active gene environment correlation mm -hmm. okay so the second thing would be uh, since behavior genetics tells us that uh, individual variation at the level of personality is not completely dependent on genes or is not fully explained by genes there's an environmental component then mm -hmm. there's one aspect of personality that can be uh, facultative right that is mm -hmm. when uh, we people can uh, sort of calibrate a little bit their personality according to the environments they are exposed to and also to the the ways they is they perceive themselves right? mm -hmm. they certainly do to some degree yeah mm -hmm. even though what keeps personality stable over the lifespan is actually more the genetic component there are good longitudinal studies on that yeah. mm -hmm. yes but but there's also evidence that uh, people uh, sort of keep track of their own uh, traits, let's say, both the psychological and the physical ones, mm -hmm. and they might adjust a little bit the, uh, some of their personality traits in accordance to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is this idea of uh, facultative calibration, uh, or uh, yeah, the calibration model of personality, as it's sometimes called, that is actually an old idea that also dates back to Tuvi and Cosmides, to the very same 1990 paper that I mentioned earlier, where they had this example that it would pay more to be aggressive if you are a big, strong guy than if you are a small, weak guy, so that people should adjust their personality to their physical traits. And that idea had been lying around for quite a while until Aaron Sell and Aaron Lukaszewski, who were both uh, doctoral students at the same university where Tubi and Cosmides are, uh, wrote their dissertations about this topic. And since then, uh, it has been, I don't know, 2012 or 2013 or something, uh, since then this idea has been in the literature. And there have been some reports that people have different personalities basically uh, 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 dependent on their physique. So especially bigger and stronger guys and more attractive women, according to the theory, should be more able to behave differently in social settings, so to use different social strategies. Because if you are intimidating to everybody because you're big and strong, or if you are very attractive and therefore very much liked or adored or uh, pursued by everybody, then by theory you could behave differently. You could behave more extroverted, you could behave more narcissistic, you could behave more aggressive, you could uh, basically feel more entitled and dare more in social situations. So this was the idea. And there have been some reports that uh, there are correlations between especially size and, and muscularity in guys and attractiveness in women and these traits. But we actually ran quite a few replication studies on it and we don't really find very much. There's a little bit for some masculine facial traits where we find a little bit with certain facets of extroversion, but the overall picture doesn't really look like body physique, and personality go together very well. And there's also another catch to the whole thing because all these original studies were just cross-sectional correlations. So it was basically young adults and they measured their strengths, their height and their personality and correlated it. But of course, the error of causality could go both ways. And there are some longitudinal studies that show that early teens, early adolescents, that are stronger don't become more aggressive uh, late teens or young adults, but the other way around, the more aggressive young adolescents become more muscular uh, young adults. 
So basically, your aggressive tendencies could also work towards you working out and building up more muscles, being in environments where it's necessary or, or uh, uh, yeah, cherished uh, when you build up more muscles. So the error of causality is not at all clear. And what you really need for studies like this is something like a twin difference design where you take one twin who's either... Uh, stronger than the other or less strong than the other and the other twin isn't and then you see if they develop different personalities over time there's hardly been any test like that in the literature there's one paper which i find not very strong that goes in the direction but overall it doesn't very uh, speak very much in the direction now the interesting bit is i had this discussion with aaron lukaszewski who's really pushing this idea quite a bit when you ask people for their self-perceptions, that goes very much hand in hand with the personality. So people who are more narcissistic, more daring, feel more entitled, also find themselves more attractive or stronger, more formidable. But that is only in their self-perceptions. It's not in their actual bodies. So if you take ratings of their faces or of their bodies, or if you really measure their strengths or measure their body dimensions, and there's no correlations at all. So it's only in their head, in their self-perception, that they think they are more attractive, more formidable when they have these kinds of personalities. And yeah, I always have this debate with Aaron how to interpret that. I would say this becomes tautological because having a more entitled narcissistic personality goes hand in hand with feeling more attractive. It can't really be... Uh, that you take that as a causal mechanism that feeling more attractive caused your neuroticism, or at least it's very, very difficult to tease apart. And so I would say this uh, overblown, overestimating self-perception is really part of your personality and is not really the mechanism that causes your personality traits. But at least at that level, it's really, really difficult to tease it apart uh, empirically. So overall, I don't think there's so much going on in terms of how you really physically are, neither how attractive nor how formidable you really physically are, and your personality. Basically, the null correlation we often find means that you can very well be very attractive and not be extroverted at all or not feel entitled at all. There's, there's simply a disjunction there. Now, you can, of course push this argument a little bit further and say, okay, nowadays people don't care very much if you are taller or stronger or more attractive. They care more about how much social influence you have, what kind of standing you have in the group, how rich you are, what socioeconomic status you are, how much power you, are, you have in your company or whatever. And these are really the traits on which it should be calibrated. But these are really way more different to tease apart from personality because people who end up in positions of social influence or power or whatever got there because they made their way there and that is probably also partly dependent on your personality so again you would need very good longitudinal studies and stuff like twin difference designs or so to really tease apart the causal direction there so overall i'm I think it's a plausible idea that we calibrate our personality on these kinds of factors, but uh, on the empirical side, I'm not really convinced that that is what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are several things here to talk about. I guess that the first one that you pointed to was the fact that really, unfortunately, in the social sciences, it's really hard to establish a causal relationship. I mean, we get correlations, some stronger, some weaker ones, but I mean, that's most of the time the best we can do. But mm -hmm. on the other end, and since we're talking about personality, I guess that when people... Uh, talk about environmental influences, the first thing is that, I mean, it's extremely hard to isolate and control for a single environmental factor in, or environmental influence, right? That, that is, we, we can control for something that the person pays attention to or something that is part of his or her environment, but I mean, there are a thousand 
different things happening at the same time. And then the other thing that I guess we have to take into account, and we have found that out through behavior genetics, I guess, is that personality in this case is about the way uh, we deal and think about the world that is different people with different personalities process the same environmental influences in different ways is that correct? exactly exactly i mean people have chased behind individual environmental influences that in, uh, affect our personality or any kind of individual differences really uh, for a very very long time and a humble statement would be that we have not really identified anything that has lasting impacts on our personality. I mean, safe, very extreme things. So if you grow up in neglect or if you have a long history of abuse or something like that, of course, that impacts you in the long run. But if we go out of this very, very extreme realm, most things that people thought influence us are not really cause or factors when you really look at it. So no matter if you win the lottery or if you get married or if you have a bad accidents and uh, uh, I, I don't know, uh, end up in a wheelchair or all these things that we really think could have a lasting impact don't really have a lasting impact. And I think I always tell my students when I give my personality lectures that probably the biggest lesson they can take from this lecture is that all these pop cultural ideas of the environment shaping us completely are simply not empirically true. That is basically the heritage of psychoanalysis and the heritage of behaviorism, which of course were two major strands in psychology. And these ideas are still in everybody's head and people kind of gravitate towards this idea that the environment shapes us. But it would be really sad if that was true, because then who you are is completely the fault of what your parents did to you. And if your mother or your father did something wrong by accident, then it probably uh, shaped you for life or scarred you for life. That would be a really, really sad world. There was a time back in the day where it was totally common knowledge that schizophrenia was completely the fault of the mother, that if the mother raised the children wrongly, then they ended up schizophrenic until behavioral genetic studies showed that schizophrenia is one of the most genetic diseases that we have, psychological diseases that we have, and that basically the least influence on schizophrenia comes from parenting. But somehow people really want to believe in this idea that how they act towards other people, how they raise their children, and so on, really has the lasting impact. When in the end, it really is the case that even small children have a rather strong personality of their own. There's this interesting saying that dates back to Marvin Zuckerman, that all people are environmentalists until they have that second child. And that is absolutely true. I have two children and they couldn't be more different. And I'm very sure that I'm very much willing to treat them alike, but they are extremely different and they also evoke very different tendencies from me. So I have a very calm boy and I have a very active and a little bit rowdy girl. And even if I want to treat them the same, I can't treat them the same because I, I, yeah, I, I have to act differently towards them because they evoke it from me. And there are actually studies out there. I mean, this was an anecdote that I was just telling, but there are studies out there that the influence of parents on their children's personality is just as big as the influence of children on their parents' personality. So the error really goes both ways. And that is really hard for some people to believe that the environmental influences are very much shaped by our own personality from early days onward. And as you correctly said, it's also how we perceive our environment. People can have, make the very same experiences and one person, I don't know, one person gets, uh, I don't know, uh, bumped on in the street or shouted at and one person laughs it off and the other person uh, has bad feelings the whole day for some reason or feels angry or feels uh, regretful or whatever. And 
that is very much due to our personality. So even exactly the same experiences don't act on us in the very same manner. And that even begins uh, with siblings in the very same family. There are good studies by Plowman and colleagues, for example, uh, that show that even siblings in the same family experience exactly the same family environment uh, in different ways. And that alone makes it extremely difficult to find out about individual environmental factors that have lasting effects on us. So in the end, we hardly know anything more about uh, environmental influences than we know about genetic influences, specifics as it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting that bit where you said that because you have two children that you really get to notice the innate uh, behavioral psychological differences between mm -hmm. them because just yesterday I, I really can't remember the name of the authors but I read the study it was a small one but anyway where they were trying to understand what were the kinds of people that had uh, a view of human uh, human psychology that was more in line with the science mm -hmm. in, ter in terms of individual differences and the conclusion that they got at was that it was mothers who had more than one child because they were exposed to, uh, to them since their birth basically and then they would immediately notice the innate differences. So mm -hmm. I, I guess that, that's, that's really interesting to, to know about. I, I read that study and I totally agree with that result. So I, I, I always say to my students, because these are the things that usually get, get the most confused faces because people simply think about the stuff differently. But when, when you teach students that are usually in their early 20s, I always think, okay, wait until you have two children, then you will know that, that there's something to it. It's something that you, I, I often tell them, think about your siblings, but with siblings, they always think, okay, there's sibling rivalry and it's about birth order. Birth order is one of the biggest myths of pop uh, psychology as well, actually. Birth order has hardly an effect on anything and certainly not on personality. So whether you are the first born, the middle born or the late born has absolutely no effect on your personality. But that is usually what people think about when they think, okay, I'm, I'm more conscientious because I always had to take care of my younger siblings or I'm more aggressive because I really had to power through with my older siblings or so. That has no lasting effect on your personality at all. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's interesting that you refer to that because that's a, sti uh, that's a myth that people still hold on to because, I mean, there were a lot of different studies and publications back in the day where people associated birth order with certain personality traits and even also with the probability of being homosexual, I guess, as well. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, there were some theories that were somewhat plausible, like, for example, certain people or certain authors said that it would make sense for uh, older siblings to be more in line with the status quo because they were born earlier and so mm -hmm. it would be it would make more sense for them to be aligned with the interests of their parents uh, and if a second or third child came on then I, I mean basically she he or she would have to be a little bit more rebellious because mm -hmm. that, that position associated with the status quo was already taken by uh, his or her younger brother or sister. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it. I guess that nowadays we know that that sort of literature uh, doesn't hold any water, right? Mm, yeah. So the old Frank Salloway ideas, and some of them date back uh, even longer, that personality is shaped in that way. That's really not true. One thing that you mentioned has actually quite a bit of uh, empirical support, and that is the birth order effect on male homosexuality. Ooh. It's actually the older brother's effect. So if you have more older brothers, then the chances for the later born boy in the family to become homosexual are higher. And there seems to be some sort of biological mechanism in play. It has probably to do with an androgenization of the female womb, of the womb of the mother, if she had already gone through pregnancies with boys before. 
but the mechanisms are not very well understood. There are sometimes new publications here and there, but I haven't seen something that really made up a full picture. But the effect that you are more likely to be homosexual when you have more older brothers as a man, uh, that effect seems to be there. And it's even there when the older siblings have died. So it is not about the social exposure to older siblings. It's not like the older brothers always held you down and that's why you became homosexual. That's nonsense. But uh, it seems to be some sort of biological effect, but it's not completely understood yet. Mm -hmm. So th the problem there is more about understanding the underlying, perhaps, physiological mechanism that gives rise to that, probably operating at the level of the uterus or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Because, yeah. I mean, even recently I talked with an evolutionary anthropologist, Dr. Abigail Page, and mm -hmm. we talked about how in certain uh, undergatherer societies, like, for example, she studies the act uh, in the Philippines, and she yeah. talks about how she found out that there was a skewed sex ratio uh, uh, in, at the level of birth because women tended to give birth to many more uh, boys than girls in that case. Uh, and then she tried out different hypotheses and different tests and basically she discovered that it, it pointed toward some sort of physiological mechanism operating mm -hmm. inside the woman at the level of the uterus, probably. Mm -hmm. but, but because I, I, I think that talking about these things is important because sometimes people might get the wrong idea that these things happen because somehow people keep track of what's happening in their environment and then consciously or unconsciously they signal uh, their sexual parts, let's say, to produce <laughs> boys or girls but i mean this would probably be um, somewhat uh, some sort of physiological mechanism that is left behind after the organism has already produced an x number of these or that sex mm. right? yeah i don't know very much about that literature i always find it curious when it's studied in humans because it's not easy to understand what mechanism could drive these sex ratio differences you know in some species it's easy i mean you probably know about turtles and that it depends on the temperature that the eggs are bred in if uh, the egg becomes male or the offspring that comes from the egg uh, becomes male or female. So there you have a clear environmental mechanism. There are some species where the sex is uh, determined by social factors. So for example, in clownfish, always the most dominant male becomes the female in the species, so they can change their sex during adult life. Uh, there these things are easy to understand, but in humans, especially since our chromosomal sex is determined in a way that the Y chromosome comes from the male sperm, it is not really easy to understand how the female body, who only gives the X that always have two X chromosomes, determines what kind of sperm fertilizes the egg or maybe discards eggs that are fertilized by the wrong sex or something like that. I have no idea what mechanisms that could be and I've yet to meet a, a biologist or a, a gynecologist or so who could explain me uh, what kind of mechanism that is. That's why I'm always a little bit wary about the uh, stood sex ratio literature in humans. I mean, what, what's clearly happening is uh, that there is a postnatal selection. I mean, we have that in China, we have that in a lot of other countries that uh, there's a selective abortion of uh, girls, for example. But of course, that, that's a cultural invention, and that's a, that's a social mechanism. But uh, on a physiological level, I find it very curious if something like that could at all exist in humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would probably have to be something that we don't know about, for example, uh, some sort of 
uh, change in the uh, at the level of the egg for it to mm. be able to reject perhaps sperm mm. that carried the Y chromosome or something yeah. like yeah. that, right? But I mean, it would be really weird, at least according to what we know now. So yeah. uh, before we move on to talking about intelligence, let me just ask you this. In terms of the personality traits, uh, do you think that the big five personality inventory is the best one that <laughs> we have at the moment to do work on personality traits? Well, we should never forget that the big five and any other of these factor analytic uh, models, be it Hexaco or Isaac or whatever, these are all purely descriptive, empirically driven models. Mm -hmm. So it is just a way, I mean, a good biologist knows that before you talk about mechanisms and functions and so on, you have to talk about description, you have to describe your species and your phenomenon and the behavior that the species shows. And we have to understand the big five or any other factor analytic model on that very level. It is a purely descriptive level, uh, purely descriptive model, and it gives you this rough idea that there are around about five dimensions broad dimensions that are reasonably independent that can roughly describe the differences that we see. Now, of course, if you go back to the history of the Big Five, to the lexicographic studies from which they emerged, they made assumptions about which words from the lexicon to use to factor analyze in the end, and they threw out insulting words, they threw out uh, uh, se uh, sex differentiating words that make differences between men and women. They uh, threw out uh, words that uh, describe physical differences and so on. So they, are, they threw out sexual terms, for example. So there's a lot of assumptions that went into the lexicographic studies that made the uh, big five emerge like they emerged. Now, when you go to the hexaco model, they basically put in the insulting and evaluative terms, and then they got a six factor with honesty, humility, so be it. So I don't really care, to be honest. These are all rough descriptions, and on a descriptive level, we have to accommodate somehow this factor space, this multidimensional space of behavioral differences, but I don't want to uh, hold a debate about whether we need honesty, humility in the model or not, or uh, I don't know, sometimes people come up with a seventh factor in some cross-cultural cross studies or so, so be it. This is rough description, we could uh, probably do better, but I doubt that it would give us that much more insight if we would do ever finer lexicographic studies to come up with ever finer um, uh, factor models. Yeah. And do you think that any other approach at another level of analysis could give us a more objective way of uh, classifying personality, like, for example, analyzing it instead of using the lexical hypothesis and analyzing different cultural sources, uh, studying the brain and defining personality traits in terms of, for example, different uh, reactivities of different areas to different <laughs> kinds of stimuli? Well, people have tried that the whole time. I would love to have more objective measures. I would love to move away from questionnaires, but so far I've yet to see something that really works. So people have tried to analyze behavior. They usually end up with a big mess. People have tried to brain scan people and come up with brain systems that underlie different personality dimensions or come up with purely neuroscientifically driven models. Now, there are some people out there that will probably hate me for saying it, but I would say we know nothing about the neuroscience of personality. There are these old Isaac models that are more or less disproven. There are some people who are still looking at the dopaminergic system and, and stuff like that, for example, and Colin de Young really comes up with some, some fancy stuff in that area, but I have yet to see something that I find fully convincing in that area. And... I mean, people have tried to develop objective tests or tests that are more like intelligence tests that are more ability-based. So define personality as an ability. Can a shy person do the same social behaviors than an extroverted person can, for example? Uh, 
that has all so far basically led to nothing. So I would love to move away from questionnaires, but I've yet to see something that I find really convincing. The whole literature is moving in the direction, and that's, as always, I, I like to quote Gerd Gigerenzer for the term tools to theories, but scientists often simply research that what is possible with the tools that they have at, at hand right now. And since everybody has a smartphone now in their pocket, it becomes way easier to do diary studies, experience sampling studies, and so on, where you collect a lot of data over the day, be it self-reports on the smartphones, or be it like halfway objective data, like GPS data and actometer data and so on. And people try to basically characterize the overall behavioral flow of people and try to get to stable individual differences based on that. I think that is where the whole field will be moving. But again, I have yet to see something that I find fully convincing. At the moment, everybody is, in my mind, moving around in the dark in that area. But probably we will find something with a huge amount of big data that we can now collect from people. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. So let's now talk about intelligence and the uh, <laughs> evolutionary genetics of intelligence. And also we can talk a little bit about the neuroscience of intelligence that I guess is uh, more robust than, mm -hmm. than the neuroscience of individual differences or personality. So uh, the first question I would like to ask you is, uh, could you tell us uh, what is the, in what ways um, measuring intelligence can also tell us something about developmental robustness or developmental robustness yes because i i mean isn't it the case that uh, higher iqs indicate that as the person was developing then she ah, was okay. she, she was more able to fight for example uh, dam uh, some sort of damage to the brain and infections and things like that but basically uh, it points toward the brain system at least being able to buffer against uh, in, in, in some sorts of invasors and uh, mm. uh, damage and things like that. Yeah. So this is basically the idea that a smart mind sits in a smart body. So the old saying that a healthy mind is in a healthy body basically goes back to that. Um, intelligence, there, there's a lot in the literature that points in the direction that a person scores higher on an intelligence test if the overall body and especially the brain works better. Now, there is certainly a lot of evidence that even micro damages or micro problems with the brain have some sort of effect on uh, intelligence. So certainly if the brain is damaged a lot, that re reduces your IQ, that's probably a no-brainer. But even when you have something like microbleeds, and that happens even in young adults, that you have um, a little bit blood uh, pouring into the body from small vessels being not intact, basically. You can measure that by measuring basically iron in the brain. These are hemosiderin uh, residuals that you can uh, make visible on an MRT scan. Um, people that have more micro or have had a history of more microbleeds in their brain have a slightly lower IQ. So the same holds for lesions in the brain. So for whatever reasons, traumata, uh, 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 ischemic insults, so blood problems with the brain, uh, you can have basically small holes in the brain. If they are, they are big, they are detrimental, we know that, but even the small ones that every healthy adult probably has here and there in their brain can have an impact on intelligence. And I myself did quite a bit of research on uh, white matter. So basically these nerve tracts that connect uh, distant areas in the brain. And we looked at overall brain white matter integrity. So basically how good all the cables are that go from different brain areas to another overall in your brain. And we found a pretty substantial relationship with overall intelligence, even in uh, healthy adults. 
which was actually mediated by information processing speed as measured by reaction time tasks, so uh, which makes theoretically a lot of sense. And if you add all of these things together, then it basically means the healthier your brain is overall, the less damaged it is overall, the more intelligent it is. Now, that goes a long way because all these little insults that can impact your brain go hand in hand with how fit your body is overall. And that develops over your whole uh, lifetime, over your whole uh, um, developmental history. So if you have a history of malnutrition or of uh, being exposed to environmental toxins, to toxic substances in the environment or radiation or if you have been exposed to a lot of pathogens, to a lot of illnesses that in fact uh, affected your development and basically led to your development being impaired, that can also have an effect, uh, effect on these kinds of things. And an interesting hypothesis that I've been interested for quite a while is the idea that what uh, came out of behavioral ecology that uh, developmental instability can be measured by body symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, that's the old concept of fluctuating asymmetry, where you basically assume that the left side and the right side of your body are under the same genetic control, and if they are not exactly the same size, then that hints slightly at some insult, at some disturbance that happened during your development. And people, it was very prominent in the 90s and early 2000s that people used this calipers that engineers uh, use as well and measured the breadth of the hand, the length of the finger, the size of the ears and all kinds of, of measures all around the body and then got an aggregate measure of that and correlated with all kinds of traits. And with intelligence, there have been quite a few, well, let's say a handful of reports that had significant results. I have always been very prone of that hypothesis. We have tried to replicate it and we partly found results for facial symmetry and uh, at least cognitive aging, so decline of cognitive ability in old age. This is actually a topic where I'm, I'm still working on a little bit and where I will want to try to get a better picture because nowadays it looks a bit old school to use these calipers to measure traits on your body. And we have a 3D body scanner, a laser-based body scanner where you can put people in and then it scans the whole body. And we are working with a team in Belgium to get good measures of symmetry out of that. And we, among other things, want to relate that to uh, intelligence as well. After the replication crisis in psychology and after I've seen some other literatures in which I'm involved crumble quite a bit, even though there were way, way more studies published on the topic, I'm not 100% sure if I totally believe this fluctuating asymmetry idea that much anymore. So I wouldn't be surprised at all to find nothing there nowadays. But the overall idea that a healthy mind sits in a healthy body and that a lot of individual differences, even in the healthy normal domain in intelligence come from basically how good the state of your brain is and how well your whole body is able to, to maintain this very expensive organ of the brain. Uh, is still an idea that I, I think uh, explains quite a bit. So I would never assume that something like balancing selection, for example, affects intelligence, but this whole idea that you are the more intelligence, uh, um, the better your brain is in a good state, uh, uh, still is very plausible to me. Mm -hmm. so, so just to make sure, is it still the case that behavior genetics nowadays points to 50% uh, of IQ or general intelligence being heritable and then around 35% the result of uh, the shared environment and then the rest that is around 15% the non-shared environment. Is that still the case? Or? That is what you get in childhood. But the older kids get and even throughout puberty, throughout adolescence, uh, the shared environment component basically completely disappears. So if you look at young adults in their 20s, they usually don't have a shared environmental component at all anymore. Mm 
So the shared environment is basically due to the fact that children are not that much in control of their environment and are very much under the control of their parents. The parents say how much they uh, do their homework, how much they learn for school, what kind of uh, spare time activities they engage on. And as long as parents have that much control over their children, the parents also affect cognitive differences. I mean, we know that learning and reading and engaging in complex topics in the end supports your intelligence. We know that extra years of schooling really have an impact. That is the environmental intervention by which you can raise the IQ. Forget about listening to Mozart or eating uh, nutritional supplements or all that stuff that all doesn't work and you can't do it with a Nintendo brain trainer or something like that. Uh, but extra schooling and extra engaging in intellectual topics does affect your intellectual development and also your IQ. And as long as the parents have a strong influence on that, you have a shared environmental component. As soon as the children are out of the house and control their own life and have to see for themselves, for example, how much they study at university, the shared environmental component disappears. Now, the heritable component actually becomes bigger throughout life. So if you look in late adult life, and especially in uh, late adulthood, like in the 70s and 80s uh, years, then uh, you sometimes get 80% heritability. So the heritable, heritable component actually goes up throughout life. 80% around adulthood, is that correct? Late ad adulthood, yeah. Middle adulthood, you often get this 50% figure that is most often cited. Mm -hmm. Okay, so could you now tell us a little bit about the best approaches that we have nowadays in terms of finding the genes that are associated in this mm -hmm. case with general intelligence? I mean, on the show, I've already had people like Dr. Robert Plomin and we talked mm -hmm. about GWA studies, mm -hmm. but uh, as far as I understand, there are some new techniques, like for example, genome-wide complex trait analysis mm -hmm. that are a bit more specific or that allow for mm -hmm. us to, to, to get really at the basis of it and understand also a little bit of the several factors that go around there, right? Could, could, mm -hmm. uh, as far as I understand, if, if I'm not correct, please uh, correct me, but could you tell us about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so GWAS is basically the most widespread uh, state-of-the-art method, so genome-wide association studies. That is basically how behavioral genetics or molecular genetics overcame all the problems of candidate gene studies. So originally, people had to have a hypothesis where in the genome is something that affects the brain, and then they knew from some animal studies that these gains uh, these genes de deal with dopamine and these deal with serotonin and so on. And they only looked at these places because that is all they knew. And GWAS was a big revolution once the human genome was sequenced, um, where they basically could do the whole thing exploratorily and basically now have these gene chips that have 500,000 to nowadays usually over a million genetic variants that are spread out all over the genome and that are known to vary between people. So all these genetic variants that are on these GWAS chips are known to have a reasonable high frequency for both variants. And so these are common genetic variants, as they say. And what they can now do is basically exploratorily associate all these genetic variants with a trait of interest. So basically run a million t-tests or regressions and look individually for all these variants if they are associated with intelligence. That's the standard GE was. And there they basically found that they need huge samples, but the bigger the samples got, the more they found. And now that we have for intelligence or at least for proxy traits like educational attainment, we have uh, sample sizes of over a million now. And there you suddenly find quite a few individual variants purely exploratorily that are robustly associated and replicate across samples and so on. But they individually explain a minuscule amount of variance. So the effect sizes are really, really small. Mm -hmm. And now one thing that they can do that Robert Plowman, for example, is pretty fond of is basically add 
all of them together by the direction they are associated with the trait in, in a large enough sample and build something like a polygenic score, which is basically like a sum score. It's like summing up items in a questionnaire, questions in a questionnaire, now, but now they are summing up the individual uh, genes on the GWAS ship, weight them by the association strengths. And then they get something like an overall sum score and for something like educational attainment that explains something like 10% variance. Now this other technique that you were alluding to, genome-wide complex trait analysis, that is basically not looking at individual genetic variants, but it is basically doing the same as a standard twin or family or adoption study is doing. Mm -hmm. You just use the genetic information that you have on the ship to basically look at very, very distant genetic relationships between random people from the population. And we know by now that if you take uh, any normal country, that people that you randomly choose from the population are usually related by the seventh or eighth degree. Of course, differs a little bit by countries depending on the... Uh, ethnic structure of the country, but usually you find very weak, distant relationships between people. And you, but if you have a million genetic variants for two people, you can basically hold them next to each other and see how similar they are on all these one million variables. And then you can see that these two people are probably closer related, are more similar on their genes than these two people. And when you do that for a large enough sample, then you can get minuscule. Uh, similarities on the genetic level and you pair that to the similarity on a trait like intelligence. So are these people that have somewhat more similar genes uh, on their GWAS ship also have somewhat more similar IQ scores? And that is basically what a genome-wide complex trait analysis does. And you can use it to estimate heritability just as you can estimate heritability from twin similarities or family similarities. And the interesting thing is that the estimates you get this way are usually pretty much exactly half the size as the heritabilities that you get from twin and family studies. So we have this interesting gap that we know heritabilities of around 50% for intelligence, say, are very robust in, uh, in twin studies. With this GCTA method, you usually get something around 25%. And then you have this gap towards 10% based on polygenic scores and even smaller if you look at the individually significant genetic variants. Now the gap between 25% GCTA and the polygenic score, that gap can be closed by larger and larger samples. So the GCTA estimate, which is sometimes called SNP-based heritability, is basically the upper limit for how good polygenic scores can get if you have indefinitely large samples and indefinitely small measurement error and so on. But the gap between GCTA and the twins, or also adoption studies, for example, that is much more difficult to explain. And that is, yeah, that is something that Plomin, for example, uh, hardly ever talks about because, because he's so focused on this new um, invention of the polygenic scores, which is a fascinating technique. But this other gap is actually way more interesting from an evolutionary perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and is it the case that the technique of GCTA, for example, uh, allows us for better identify uh, rare variants associated mm -hmm. with, gen uh, with general intelligence? Well, standard GCTA doesn't, because standard GCTA well, what you have on these GWAS ships are only the uh, common genetic variants. And when okay. you run a standard GCTA or GWAS analysis, you throw out the closely related individuals. So you don't want to have families in that sample because all the similarities in these families can be due to purely environmental reasons. And you don't know if you are more similar to your father or your brother because you grew up in the same household or because you share some family-specific genes. So the standard GCTA literature completely focuses on the common genetic variants in not related individuals. And everything that hints at relatedness is basically thrown out of the samples. Mm 
Now, we recently did a study together with my colleague David Hill in Edinburgh, who I think is very much at the forefront of this literature on the molecular genetics of intelligence. Uh, we did a very interesting study where we left the families and the related individuals in the sample, but we controlled for environmental similarity by estimating it directly. So we had a variance component that basically uh, was similarity between uh, parents and offspring and between siblings and also between the parents themselves. So we modeled all this standard family similarity, which we deemed environmental, which was an assumption there, uh, directly, but also ran the GCTA on the closer related individuals. And setting all this directly modeled environmental uh, similarity aside, we suddenly found a very substantial uh, SNP heritability component that would usually not appear in these GCTA studies that was due to genetic effects that happen within the family. Mm -hmm. And those can be these kinds of genetic variants that maybe occurred in the grandfather or the great-grandfather or the great-great-grandfather, but were not selected out and just ran in this family. So it might be that one specific family has genetic variants that no other family had because mm -hmm. they appeared in that great-grandfather and only the offspring of this great-grandfather passed uh, pass them on. But all the other families in the population don't have this genetic variant. And this is what we are getting at with um, uh, what we call Gremel kin so this GCTA method, the statistics behind it uh, is called Gremel. that's uh, um, it's basically a statistic model, and uh, we call this method Gremel kin because it looks at these GCTA relationships within uh, kin relationships. And so what we found in this paper is that for intelligence, half of the heritability is due to common genetic variants. That's these 25% that uh, GCTA usually finds, half of the 50% heritability. The other half was due to family-specific genetic variants, which can very well be these rare genetic variants that just occur in individual families. And then there were some environmental components, but they were not very strong and not very con consistent. We replicated it with a similar method that has different assumptions that stratifies the uh, GCTA results by the minor allele frequency, so by the lower frequency. But that's probably getting into too much detail now. But uh, we basically showed with two independent methods that about half the heritability of intelligence is due to family-specific genetic variants, which are most likely rare genetic variants. And that is extremely interesting from, again, the evolutionary genetic perspective, because it hints to that mutation selection balance could basically explain at least half the heritability of intelligence. And that, again, is very much in line with this whole idea of somebody being more intelligent because his brain and his body is overall in a better state because if the body is less interrupted by rare mutations and mutations occur, they are usually like random errors in a text. They usually don't make the text better but worse. And in the same way, these rare family-specific genetic variants usually disrupt something. And that could basically be the, the, the kind of biological basis for intelligence. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those uh, rare family-related variants that you found out, I, I mean, they explain half of the heritability, right? So in terms of the entire percentage of variance between people, that would account for uh, around 25%. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that, that's a lot. That, that's, that's a, a lot. Qua that's a quarter of the variance. Yes. I mean, just like with standard GCTA, we can't say which are the exact genetic variants. This method is only estimating a variance component. So we cannot say these are the genes. So it's not like we have identified all these family-specific genes. But that is something that is possible with modern techniques. So now that we can do genome-wide sequencing, where we don't only look at a million randomly distributed genetic variants throughout the genome, 
in a sampling manner, but where we basically read out the whole genome, look at all 3.3 billion base pairs. And when we take these genome-wide sequences from parents and from offspring, we can compare the genome of the child with the parents and see is there anything in the genome that neither the father nor the mother had. And these are basically so-called de novo mutations, mutations that occurred just in that generation that occurred at the conception of that very child. And then you can have a look at these genetic variants have done anything. This has been done, for example, in the autism literature and a lot of uh, spontaneously occurring cases of autism are explained by mutations that spontaneously occurred in that generation. So these kinds of techniques potentially can also be used for intelligence, but it's expensive, so it's not the case that it will be easily done. Right. And is it the case that are, uh, anyone has already been able to link these genes that, you've, uh, that you have identified, both the common variants and the rare variants, to some sort of um, brain mechanism? Some, uh, I, I mean, do you already know if these mm. specific genes give rise to some sort of brain organization or, or brain pathways that are associated with uh, intelligence? Yeah, to do something like that, you have to know the individual genes. So you have to have significant effects for individual genes. So GCTA or our new method can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do it with the GWAS results nowadays. So again, my colleague David Hill recently had a, a, a GWAS where he combined uh, results for intelligence, educational attainment, and another trait, I think socioeconomic status, and uh, found a few hundred genetic variants, common genetic variants that are robustly associated with intelligence. And in this case, you can then look up what these, what is known about these individual genetic variants and do so-called pathway analysis and see if it brings you to an overall picture. And it is actually the case that the majority of these genetic variants that have been identified for intelligence are expressed in the brain. So this is good news, even though it can work peripherally. So if your heart doesn't work as it should, or your whole metabolism, your I don't know, your digestive system doesn't work as it should, that might over development also affect your brain indirectly. So it is not totally unconceivable that genes that say, or affect your immune system, for example, uh, also affect your brain. But a lot of them are expressed in the brain. And there is some hints that there are some fancy graphs where they try to make a sense out of all of them. Um, there is some hints that they have something to do with brain development, uh, but yeah, delving deeper into the mechanisms is really complicated. I don't think we are quite there, and that is not totally my area of expertise, I have to say. I leave that to the hardcore uh, neurobiologists. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now let's move on to the last topic of our conversation that has to do with uh, mate preferences uh, and uh, I mean, and now uh, women's preferences in terms of sexuality and mm -hmm. we, we will also talk about mate preferences during the menstrual cycle, even though that's a bit uh, of a contentious topic, right? But uh, uh, topic. Yeah, but but anyway, let's start with this, because uh, particularly when we were talking about personality inventories, for example, in the big five, we were referring to the fact that, uh, I mean, it relies too much on questionnaires and things like that. And so basically people reporting uh, their own thinking and their own behavior. But uh, I mean, there are other approaches to studying people's behavior more directly, and in the case of, ma of mate preferences in your work, you've already used things like speed dating. So mm -hmm. could you explain to us in what ways speed dating allows for us to have a more objective account 
of people's mate preferences. Mm -hmm. yeah, the whole mating literature and sexual strategies and, and romantic partner choice and so on, it's another topic that I always find very fascinating that actually also dates back to my undergraduate days. And um, the thing is, when you study mate preferences, you can either ask people what they want in a mate, mm -hmm. but that assumes that they have conscious reflection about right. how they do their choices and we know from behavioral economics and from all kinds of literatures marketing and so on that people don't always really know what they want or how they will decide and so if somebody tells you yeah i'm not looking at attractiveness i want character or i want whatever uh, that might or might not be true and there's a huge literature that has only been analyzing self-reported made preferences david bus uh, Uh, made a huge impact in their literature and that's all very interesting but we don't really know if these self-reported preferences do anything at all and that is something that always bugged me the other thing you can do is look at couples that are already together and look for example how similar they are but the formation of couples is also a complex process because both are choosing it's not like you go to a shop and buy, I don't know, a new television or something, then you choose the television. But if you do romantic partner choice, you have mutual choice, so both are choosing each other. And so you don't really know if the couples that end up together reflect any ones of their preferences individually. So that doesn't tell you the whole picture either. And the couples that you can study are also the ones that made it to a certain point in a relationship, so there's a survival bias there and so on. So it is really difficult to get closer to the process of mate choice and that always bugged me. Actually, with some self-reported preferences, we have a big project running at the moment. We are the first ones who really do extensive longitudinal studies, starting with singles, asking them what they want in a partner and then follow them over time and see in what relationships they end and how much the partner they really end up with reflects their initial preferences. And we have a project that my uh, co-worker Tanja Gerlach uh, is working on at the moment, the Göttingen Mate Choice Study, that actually showed that standard mate choice preferences do to some degree predict which partners you end up with. But if you end up in a relationship with a partner that doesn't really match your standards, you downregulate your preferences. So your preferences are not completely stable. They are somewhat stable, but they are also adjusted at least what you say you want, is adjusted to whom you end up with. We are currently working right in the room next to me. My doctoral student, Julie Driebe, is working on a 14 years longitudinal study where we asked the people about their mate preferences and we now followed up their whole romantic history over the last 14 years. So they reported basically on every longer partner they had over the last 14 years and how much these preferences predict really made choices over a substantial proportion of their life. That is ongoing work and I can probably tell you something about it if we speak in a year or two again. Um, so, so much about self-reported preferences, but it often bugged me that self-reports are really not totally what people are doing. And it was actually even before I started my PhD in Berlin that I did an internship with Peter Todd, who's now a professor at Indiana University, also an evolutionary psychologist. And he got interested in this topic of speed dating. Speed dating was a really new thing. It's, I think nowadays it's pretty common knowledge. It's basically where a room full of singles, half men, half women, basically everyone speaks to everyone for a few minutes and then they make individual decisions if they want to see each other again and if there's a match, then they get each other's contact details. It was invented by New York Rabbi actually for bringing people together in his community. And that was super new back in the days. It must have been 2000, uh, 2003 maybe or so. And we started to study speed dating events in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And then during my dissertation, I had the chance to get some money. And I said, okay, I want to run my own speed datings to do everything under experimental control. And that was rather novel at that point. In parallel, uh, uh, Eli Finkel and Paul Eastwick did the same in the US. 
They're probably a little bit more famous for it now, but uh, we basically started it at the same time individually. And we basically organized our own speed dating events and went to great lengths to basically let men and women to separate entrances of a large building and then had them in separate waiting rooms. And then we had little booths, little uh, separated areas where basically the women were seated in and then the men rotated through and they only saw the women for the very first time when they entered this booth and we had uh, video recorders, video cameras uh, and microphones in this booth and we basically recorded the first three minutes they ever saw each other mm -hmm. and uh, analyzed the videos later on but also asked them a lot beforehand and afterwards and of course asked them to make a decision if they wanted to see this person again. And we did that with a total sample of uh, almost 400 people. I think it was 384 or something like that across all kinds of age ranges. And these were real singles. So a lot of studies are done with students that pretend to be looking for romantic partners. These were all real singles that were really motivated to find a partner in that study. And uh, yeah, that way we came way closer uh, to, to the whole mate choice process. Fun story is actually, last year I got an email from a person who participated in that study now 13, 14 years ago. And he said he's now marrying the woman he met at that speed dating. And they wanted to have the videotape from the first three minutes they ever met for their wedding. And we sent it to them and we got some nice pictures from their wedding reception back. So. At least in that case, the uh, study was really successful. <laughs> and in terms of results, I mean, um, we had a whole paper about what men and women are really looking at for this first initial decision. And perhaps not too surprisingly, attractiveness, physical attractiveness, uh, visual attractiveness is a big factor of it, especially for men evaluating women basically explains the majority of the variance. Vocal attractiveness, so how attractive your voice sounds, has an independent uh, effect over and above visual attractiveness for both men and women. And women were also looking at attractiveness, but were also looking at other traits, so men who were less shy and who were actually more unrestricted in their social sexuality, which basically means they were more sexually experienced, probably due to that more confident in these situations. Uh, they came across better. Women also picked up something about education and socioeconomic status within the first three minutes that factored in into their vote. But by far and large, attractiveness is really the big filter for at least the first uh, encounter for getting acquainted. So for initial encounters, attractiveness actually, as simple as it may sound, uh, uh, matters a lot. Mm -hmm. And did you also study, or were you able to study the specific physical traits of each sex that were mm -hmm. referred by the opposite sex? Mm -hmm. We looked a bit into, a, uh, into that a little bit. We had height and weight, so BMI. We had waist to hip ratio. We had standardized photos from which we looked at facial metrics, so facial masculinity, facial symmetry, and all this stuff that is often discussed as individual cues in the literature. So there's a whole literature on facial masculinity or femininity. There's a whole literature on waist to hip ratio and so on. None of these individual cues really did a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think there is something that a lot of people don't realize. It's something completely different if you study cues individually in an experimental design or if you study real life encounters. So if you take a photo and all you manipulate in that photo is masculinity or femininity and you give that to people to decide which of these two photos that is super standardized in every other manner is more attractive, then they pick up on this cue masculinity, femininity. But if you put real people in real situations with all the cues, with behavior, with the grooming, with how they dress, with probably how they smell and everything, then that really doesn't factor in that much. So you can get 
significant and robust effects in these experimental designs where you isolate individual cues, but in natural situations, it's more the overall picture. And uh, as I said, so physical attractiveness, so ratings of the face and of the body, they really matter, but uh, the individual cues in comparison have minuscule effects that weren't significant in our study. Mm -hmm. The exception being male height, maybe. Height had some effect. And actually, quite a lot of women complained because we instructed them to stay seated in this booth. And the men came in and they uh, and had to sit down because otherwise they would have been out of the picture for our cameras. And a lot of women complained about that in the study because they wanted to stand up and stand next to the men to evaluate their own height in comparison to the male height because women really care about the men at least not being smaller. And uh, I'm not even sure if that is a very evolutionary thing or if there's uh, a lot of cultural standard in there as well, but that is something that really mattered even in our study. Mm -hmm. So before moving on to the next topic, just to make this clear, what you are able to study through speed dating studies is basically the the cues that people pick up on on yeah. a very short period of time. I, I mean, things related to uh, what they pick up unconsciously at the level of physical traits and also some personality cues that they are able to derive from the way people, uh, I, I mean, perhaps their body disposition uh, and the way they talk and the way they look at them and things like that. So the, uh, the, it is these kinds of things that we can study through that. Mm. Right. Exactly. The really interesting bit is, I mean, there's a whole literature in personality called the zero acquaintance literature, which is about what can people say about strangers if they only have very minimal information. So if you only get 30 seconds of video of somebody, can you say something about this person? And surprisingly, the initial ideas that people develop about other people are rather accurate. So even personality judgments, not only attractiveness judgments go uh, pretty quickly. And uh, of course, you can immediately see the gender of the person and uh, stuff like that. But even personality judgments, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, and so on, even after 30 seconds of video are rather accurate and are rather in line with what good friends would say about the same person or what this person would say about him or herself. And... That is something that we are building up with, uh, uh, onto with our speed dating designs, because when people interact for, 30, uh, uh, for, for three minutes, as in the case of our study, that's not very much, but it is enough to get quite a bit of an impression. And if you go out to a club or a bar or somewhere and somebody chats with you for three minutes, you already know, is this person interesting or not, or does this person have some characteristics that make me vary or so, you pick up on that very easily. And that is the same kinds of processes that we want to study in speed dating. And the nice thing about speed dating is that it's designed in a way that everybody talks to everybody. So that's what's called a round robin design or more precisely a block design uh, that uh, is basically exactly the kind of experimental design you would want to have in the lab if you analyze these kinds of uh, interperson processes and that is exactly why we got interested in speed dating. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's move on to the last topic about mate preferences and the last topic of the interview. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I, I know, because I read an article that I think was published by Steve Gangstead on Psychology Today about an exchange that he had with uh, him and Marty Hazelton uh, on Age Bears this year uh, about, <laughs> about a very specific aspect of uh, human sexual desire throughout their menstrual cycle, particularly when they're ovulating or during mm -hmm. their ovulation phase, that is. Uh, so Steve Gangstead and Marty Hazelton basically say that the, liter the literature point toward uh, women increasing their sexual desire in their ovulation phase and also uh, preferring uh, sexual activity w with men that are not their partner, that is men outside of their 
relationship, right? But y you think that that second aspect is not correct. Mm -hmm. Am I interpreting it right? So we came to this conclusion. So to have to have the whole story, I was always super fascinated by the literature. And I think Steve Gangstead and this whole uh, strategic pluralism model that he published on which this whole cycle literature is based is probably some of the stuff that influenced me the most during my career. I am an evolutionary psychologist and I always looked at this topic through this lens. And actually, when I came here to Göttingen, got my professorship and had a lot of freedom about which topics to study, I actually wanted to do some replications of this stuff because I believed in it. I actually want, wanted to find extra evidence. I thought some of the former studies could have made uh, been made stronger and we had the resources here to run stronger studies. And so I wanted to run replication studies on build up on that. And actually the one study that uh, Steve and I are discussing the most at the moment, the dissertation project of my uh, co-worker, Julia Stern, formerly Julia Jünger, so the, most of these articles are still published as Julia Jünger. That project came about when Steve and I were standing at an HBES conference at a bar, and I asked him, okay, which traits do you really think these preference shift happen on? So there's a lot of stuff studied in the literature from skin to voices to height to facial masculinity and so on. And facial masculinity was debated at that point. And Steve said, yeah, I never believed in facial masculinity. And I said, okay, tell me which aspects you really think these shifts should happen on. And he said, body masculinity, muscularity, and behavioral dominance, behavioral confidence, or behavioral indicators like that. And I said, okay, I have the resources, I have a PhD student, I will run a huge pre-registered replication study on it, I will try to make methodologically everything as good as I can, and then we get the results and maybe it will totally underline the theory. So that is how the whole thing came about. So we were very early, the repl replication crisis really took off around 2014 maybe, 13, 14 maybe, and that was around the time when we designed the study, so we were one of the first who really wrote a pre-registration. So our pre-registration was very early on, there were hardly any guidelines how to do it, there were hardly any experiences how to do it, but we wrote this pre-registration for the study where we detailed everything, how we would do it methodologically, our hypothesis up to very individual predictions, we wrote a, a few bits about how we uh, want to analyze the data. And then we ran the study. And it turned out that we found nothing. And so all the effects on preference shifts, meaning that women in the fertile phase of their menstrual cycle should prefer different men with different cues, for example, different body types, did not turn out at all. We looked at all kinds of different body cues. We looked at body, muscul uh, body uh, masculinity overall. So we looked at height, but we also looked at muscularity and all kinds of different things. And we found nothing. And we, so I'm very highly on robustness checks. So I don't believe if one single statistical test gives you a significant result because history of psychology so shows us that it's most often not the case. If other ways to analyze the data don't show the right results. So we ran a huge amount of robustness checks and basically analyzed our data every possible way, everything that is reasonable, and we found absolutely nothing. So we submitted this paper and published it, and Steve was actually, I think, even involved in the, in the review process, but we made our data and our analysis open. I'm a big proponent of open data. So everything about our studies, at least in the last six, seven years, is available on the internet. And uh, so Steve uh, downloaded our open data and had a look at it. That's how open science should work. And he then wrote a reanalysis of our data where he apparently found 
that there was a way to analyze the data that you get a significant result. So what he did was very different. He didn't look at body masculinity overall. He focused very much on muscularity. We had seven cues of masculinity in the data. He focused on two. He aggregated them in a certain way. He used data from another study that was based on the body stimuli that we are using. So he drew in other data from our lab and Basically, that way, you uh, created a totally different uh, body variable, but he also analyzed the data very differently. He focused on measured hormones that we had. We focused on fertile phase that we determined by luteinizing hormone tests and by counting methods and so on. And he then basically wrote a long piece where he said that the way we were analyzing our data was not optimal. He made a very long case for why the way he was analyzing the data was the optimal way, and he found a significant effect. And he found a strange interaction with relationship status of the women that he couldn't really explain either, but he thought this is interesting enough. But he made a case out of that that we underreported our data. So that is what he's usually saying to us you didn't report your data in enough detail, which I find kind of strange because even the original paper has over 90 tables in the supplement where we report different ways of analyzing more or less the same basic hypothesis. So I would probably say there are hardly any papers in the literature that were so detailly documented in terms of analysis in that paper. And yeah, now he's he and Marty actually are making a big case out of the fact that his reanalysis found an effect, that we underreported that effect, and that the whole null replications that come out overall in the literature should be taken with a grain of salt because it could very well be that we are too easily embracing null findings at the moment, which is a kind of valid concern, but in our case, it is, I mean, it's our data that we are talking about. So we know the data that we are talking about in and out. And we looked at it and looked at the analysis he did. And the analysis really only return a significant finding when you analyze them exactly the way how he did it. Now, we have just submitted a response to this reanalysis. This is brand new news. You're probably one of the first hearing about it but we did a so-called multiverse analysis. I'm not sure if you've heard about that, but that basically means you analyze your data in every reasonable way and just plot how many of these results turn out significant. And the interesting thing is he has a table in his paper where he details all the different ways how his analysis differ from our analysis. And all of these steps I mean, he makes a strong argument why he thinks that's the right way to analyze the data, but you can very well make arguments for the ways we did it. And if you combine all these steps, you end up with a lot of analyses. You end up with over 480 statistical models, and you end up with over 1,200 significance tests that speak to the hypothesis. We plotted all these significance tests. Less than 2.5% of these 1,200 significance tests are significant. That's less than you expect by chance, mm -hmm. given a 5% significance value. The distribution is all over the place, so it's a very much a uniform distribution. Actually, the significant findings are less likely than you would expect by chance. And the one he is reporting in his paper is the lowest one of this over 1,200 significance tests. So I don't know how he came to that exact model, but he managed to find out that one way out of 1,200 significance tests that are all reasonable in their way that yields a significant result. If you tweak any little bit about his model, it totally breaks together. The few models that come out significant here are all over the place. It's not like there's a pattern there. It's not like that one decision is really the crucial one. They are really all over the place. To me, that looks like a null result <laughs> because, I mean, yeah. 
the other thing is, I mean, he sometimes brings this argument now, yeah, we should move away from significance testing and significance thresholds are totally arbitrary and so on. And I'm totally on board with that. But if you do research that matters, then you should be able to name an effect size that is the lowest effect size that is of practical interest. Daniel Larkin says in the whole paper about that. So how small can an effect be that it's still interesting. The effect he reports is rather small and he doesn't really commit to anything there. So if he doesn't accept significance testing and he says Bayesian testing with Bayes factors, it's, a, it's the same arbitrary cutoff as significance testing. He doesn't commit to an effect size. At which point is the hypothesis falsifiable? What can we ever do to falsify that hypothesis? And I mean, I'm not against this hypothesis. Actually, my thinking would be easier if the shift of preferences across the menstrual cycle was still true. In the very same data set, we find no shift for preferences for vocal masculinity, so for deeper voices in men, and we find no shift in um, preferences for all different kinds of behaviors that we had from, from videos that were rated of men and women getting acquainted with each other. So neither dominance nor flirtatious behavior or masculine behavior, individual cues like, like eye contact or all that kind of stuff, nothing. So for three different domains, we find no results there. His reanalysis really, I, I mean, I don't want to, to imply any, any uh, evil intentions there, but I think he must fool himself quite a bit if he, if he thinks that that single one significant finding is, is really proven anything there. And we are not even the only ones. Ben Jones, Ula Machinkowska, uh, Katrin van Stein and so on, they all recently had papers out there and with really, really good designs of cycle studies that find nothing. And the only studies that found something are the older ones that usually have rather weak designs, especially if it's between women designs with cycle, then the power is abysmal. Steve showed it uh, himself and published uh, power analysis. And so on the one hand, you have the old literature, which are very weak designs, usually very low power. And there you have some significant effects, but no open data to really show that they are really there. Maybe it is again only that one model that worked in that data. And on the other hand, you have ours in some other big data sets, better designs, open data, everybody can look at it. And no matter how you look at it, there's no effect there. So I'm pretty convinced there's nothing there. I think this debate will go on and I kind of doubt at this point that Steve and I, even though I like Steve very much on a, on, a, on a personal level, I've been in contact with him for years and I visited him, stayed at his place, he stayed at my place, so it's, it's not like that we are, we are anonymous enemies on the internet or something, but I doubt that we will reach consensus on this point and at this point I just say to everybody, look at his reanalysis, look at our reanalysis. If you're really eager, look at the open data, make your own picture. In my mind, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's very interesting because we are talking about uh, shifts in mate preferences during the um, menstrual cycle and that and people usually tie that literature with uh, sh uh, shifts at the level of hormones like progesterone uh, mm -hmm. and estrogen and I mean uh, could could that also have some implications if it's really correct that there are there's no evidence for shifts in mate preferences could that have some implications to how we interpret the literature that deal with the same thing, but for women that are on the pill. Yeah, that's a very interesting topic in itself. So independently, we did some large online diary studies. We have now two studies where we studied over a thousand women for in one case 40 days, in one case 70 days. So in one case, one cycle, in one case, two cycles. And uh, about a third of them were on the pill, the others were natural cycling in both samples. And what you clearly see is that in naturally cycling women, 
that are not breastfeeding, not pregnant, don't have hormonal interruptions in some way and are not on hormonal birth control, that they have a clear shift in sexual desire across the fertile window. So when estradiol is highest and progesterone is lowest, so estradiol to progesterone ratio is uh, highest, then you clearly see that these women have an increase in sexual desire. And you see that in self-reported sexual desire, you see that in both desire for their own partner if they have one, but also in desire for other men, even if they have a partner. You see that in masturbation tendencies and you see a weak effect even for sexual behavior, even though sexual behavior naturally is constrained by circumstances. So a sexual partner is not always available and willing and whatever. Um, so there is definitely something going on with the female psyche and female mating psychology over the cycle. We clearly show that. Um, that is independent of preference shifts because one is women basically being more lustful, having a higher sex drive, being more interested in men. We also see that in our studies that women in general rate men higher it's independent of a preference shift because a preference shift means they rate certain men higher and others not. So they want more masculine men and not more feminine men. What we see is really that they rate all men higher. They desire the most masculine men more, but they desire the least masculine men as much more. That is a pattern we have in our data. And that basically shows that there's something going on there. The pill actually more or less nullifies this effect. And we clearly show that now in two samples of a thousand women where we can compare 600, 700 uh, women naturally cycling against 300 women on the pill. So there's quite a bit of statistical power there. And we can clearly show that none of these effects exist in women on the pill. So the pill naturally takes away the fertile phase. That's how the pill works. Otherwise women would be able to get pregnant. And with that, regulated by the hormones, regulated by estradiol and uh, progesterone mainly, they also lose this peak in uh, sexual desire. And that is quite an implication. I mean, it is partly written uh, on, the, on the instructions uh, when you buy the pill that it can have these side effects, but I think it should actually be made more obvious to women that they are doing something on that level with them when they are taking the pill. I mean, the pill has many advantages on many different levels, not only as a contraceptive. A lot of women also take it because it uh, has other medical benefits and helps them with their periods and so on. But they should be made aware that the decreasing effect on sexual desire of the pill uh, is real. And um, it's quite an implication. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided to ask you that question also because in two weeks I will be interviewing Sarah Hill that is about to release a book that is titled, um, I guess, This is Your Brain on Birth Control, I guess that's mm -hmm. the title. And okay. uh, and I, and uh, there's a very interesting thing that, it, uh, that she talks about there that has to do with the fact that women on the pill, of course, don't go through the evolutory cycle, uh, the evolutory phase of the cycle and so uh, they don't experience uh, those shifts in terms of increased uh, libido or increased sexual activity if they have access to partners and and those kinds of things but one of the things she talks about is again uh, resorting to that literature that pointed toward shifts in mate preferences that pill could have an effect in terms of women being less able to if they are on the pill to choose a partner that, that have uh, proper uh, genetic traits that are exp expressed by proxy at the level of some of their phenotype, right? And, mm. and, and so that probably would question at least that small bit of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, until a few years ago, that was absolutely uh, the state of the literature. So, I mean, these preference shifts uh, were really uh, widely seen. So I can totally understand why she has it in her book. And I mean, uh, Marty Hazelton has this book, Hormonal, that talks about the same things. Um, Alexandra Alverne, uh, 
wrote a paper a few years ago where she was talking about the side effects of the pill and also listed that. But I really think that that literature is not robust, is falling apart at the moment a bit. So, I mean, even back in 2014, there were two meta-analyses coming out on the same topic. One from Marty Hazelton Group, uh, first author was Kelly Gildersleeve, and one from Wendy Wood. And both were analyzing the same literature, more or less, and both came to totally different conclusions. One was clearly showing this preference shift as predicted by the uh, good genes ovulatory cycle shift hypothesis. The other one was completely disputing it and was basically claiming that there's nothing there. And I actually at that time was totally uh, believing the Gildersleeve meta-analysis until we and other labs, Ben Jones, Ula Maczynkowska, Katrin, Stein, Katrin von Stein and so on, basically showed that there is actually nothing there and that there is probably a publication bias in the literature that led to the fact that uh, for the longest time we believed this effect was rather robust. And since the cycle shift doesn't seem to exist, I mean, we haven't tested all kinds of cues yet. Could be, I mean, there's... There's only, I think, three studies that looked at uh, the scent of symmetry. So do more symmetric men smell differently? And does, uh, uh, do women in the ovulatory phase of their cycle prefer these men more for uh, sexual activities? There are three studies in the literature that show this effect that have rather strong effect sizes, but these are only three studies. No one ever has replicated that. All these three studies come from Steve Gangster and Randy Sornhill. So it might very well be that this effect is robot, but robust, but it might also very well be that it is not robust. At this point, I probably doubt completely that there are any preference shifts. And the interesting thing is, I mean, what you always have to keep in mind, humans are more or less a poor pair bonding species. Mm -hmm. So, of course, short-term matings existed and probably has always existed in our evolutionary past, but by far and large, we are not bonobos and we are not chimpanzees. Chimpanzees and bonobos, females, sometimes have hundreds of sexual contacts per cycle with dozens of male partners. Hardly any human female has that. But for chimpanzees and bonobos, that is standard. And the mating strategies of humans, of course, can include short-term mating and do include short-term mating, but the standard mating strategy is long-term pair bonding. And the standard way how humans reproduce is in long-term pair bonds. And even the numbers of, uh, of um, extra pair uh, children, so of children that were sired by somebody than the main partner, are extremely low in humans, and there are genetic studies that show that they have also been historically extremely low. So this whole idea of women going around and shopping for good genes when fertile is not most plausible for our species. It might exist in other species. There are reports about uh, pair bonding, uh, um, pair bonding birds like great tits that sometimes have really high extra per sire rates, but that doesn't seem to exist in humans. So this whole idea that we have adaptations or that human females have adaptations specifically for picking out genetic quality independent of whom they are with in a long-term bond is, even from a theoretical point, a rather courageous one. And that's why this whole idea of preference shift, because the whole preference shift only makes sense if women have sex in order to get children when fertile, independent of whom they are with in their long-term relationship, maybe it is not the strongest theory to start with for humans. Mm -hmm. On the other side, it totally makes sense that women are more interested in sexuality when they are fertile. Because, of course, humans as a mammalian species, we want to reproduce and women can do a lot of things with their time. And it makes sense to be more motivated to invest their time in sex when they are able to conceive and invest their time in other things 
when they are not able to conceive. That's uh, Jim Roney's motivational priority theory, which is an alternative to Marty Hazelton's and Steve Gangstad's perspective. And I think that is very much plausible, but it's probably this whole idea of mate choice for good genes is actually falling apart on many fronts. And I recently talked to David Buss about it and he told me that he's not believing in that anymore for 10 years now. Um, and I actually, even though I've been always very much fascinated by idea, uh, by that idea, I'm moving away from that very much as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I, I mean, since you refer to chimpanzees and bonobos, would the evolutionary rationale behind the evolution of our long-term uh, pair bonding relationships be the fact that, particularly when comparing with those two species, our infants are the most dependent ones for the longest stretches of time? Would that be the evolutionary rationale for it? Exactly. A newborn chimpanzee or a newborn bonobo can move rather well and and can be carried on the mother's shoulder with no problem. Uh, human offsprings uh, are extremely dependent. A human baby is just lying around there and if you don't care for it all the time, it will simply die. And so this whole idea of parental investment and that humans are a species that have a very high demand for parental investment uh, that that's definitely a very strong theoretical idea. And even due to that, I mean, nowadays women can rather easily, well, not rather easily, but they can afford it to raise a child without uh, a father. It's mm. still not an easy task unless you are super rich. But in most small-scale societies and in former times, the father does have an important role. I mean, humans always compensated, human females always compensated uh, for it by alloparenting. So female relatives have always uh, had a huge role in, in raising offspring. But paternal investment, investment of fathers and offspring is really a big fitness benefit to the, to the mother and the child. And uh, therefore... It is more rational to assume that our mating psychology evolved around that. And especially, I mean, I have no doubt that there are adaptations for short-term matings as well. So we have desires for partners outside of relationships and so on. And there might be some functional design there. But the whole idea that these motivations are tied to shopping for good genes, to choosing these partners for good genes and fertile and get pregnant from somebody who's not your primary partner, which is the whole idea of this uh, strategic pluralism model that has always been a very, very high risk evolutionary strategy. And it was a very popular idea, but I think we have to reconsider it. Okay, so Dr. Penke, we've already done two hours, so you've been oh, yeah. very generous with your time. Let's end the interview here, but just before we go, you, uh, we go, would you like to tell people what would be the best places on the internet for them to find more about your work? About my work? Well, I have a homepage, it's uh, www.laspenke.eu. There you can uh, find my publications and all my stuff. And uh, if you simply Google, uh, simply Google me, you will probably uh, find everything you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So again, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. And it was a real pleasure to have you on the show. I really loved the conversation. So, Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Hi everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you don't like Patreon, you also have the alternatives of Subscribestar 
and PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Santel Gilinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Gondriano, Yane Eninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Doctors Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, and Bo Weingard, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.